Hi, and welcome everybody to this session about artificial intelligence. I am very excited today to hear the different perspectives uh, that we will hear about uh, artificial intelligence and a lot of used cases, user cases about artificial intelligence, and especially as we are in the field in publishing, authoring, ed tech, and of course also device technology. So um, I, our speakers today here are experts in their fields, and I'm very happy to welcome Colin Hauer from Goldfinch. He will uh, say a few words about himself uh, just in a little while when he will start his presentation. Then I'm also welcoming Gerald Tsai from Singapore. He's based in Singapore um, and is, work, or is the MD of a company called Snap Learn. And I'm welcoming Max, uh, Mats Rydal from Denmark. He's joining us from Denmark and Europe. Um, and uh, he is working for a company called Cactus Communications. So he'll tell us more about his work as well. And also from Jakarta, joining us, Alfred Budiman from uh, Samsung in Jakarta. So welcome everybody. We will start with Colin. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, while I try to share my screen, just a few words about myself. Uh, Colin Hauer calling from Hamburg today. Uh, and for the past, uh, uh, well, almost two decades, um, I started early, have been moving between the content industries and technology. Can you see my screen? Hopefully, yes. And this looks good. So I'll be talking about um, artificial intelligence um, and what it can do for the publishing industry. And uh, first of all, I want to start very briefly by talking about uh, a bit about the definition of AI. What do we actually understand uh, as AI? So there's a lot of different definitions out there. Um, surely the other speakers today will go a little bit into that as well. Uh, but I'll share, share my uh, view on this with you. Um, so whenever we talk about artificial intelligence uh, these days, we usually mix human intelligence or how we perceive that with uh, what we think AI to be. So whenever we see machines do something that we perceive as intelligent, all right, if they, if they do something that reminds us of human intelligence, that's what we typically call artificial intelligence in the general population these days. Um, and you can really see that um, if you look at the different AI fields, different areas there, they're all actually quite closely connected to um, human uh, skills and senses like knowledge-based systems, robotics, computer vision, which is like seeing things, natural language processing, which is closely connected to speaking, uh, or machine learning, uh, which is actually the critical aspect of, uh, of AI and the reason why AI has been such a big uh, topic in the past couple of years. So especially in the last decade, we've seen really huge technological advances that has allowed a much, a much larger um, uh, introduction of, of AI uh, applications in the commercial sector. Um, and machine learning is a central aspect here because that's essentially, as the name says, the ability of a machine to learn um, and to get better at certain tasks. Um, and it's also quite important to understand uh, the difference between uh, two types of AI. Typically, they're called weak AI and strong AI. Strong AI being usually what we see in the movies, right? This superhuman AI that can do everything uh, super smart. Um, and uh, is quite futuristic. We're not talking about that today. We're talking about weak AI, which is really more like a skilled worker that can do one certain task and is really good at one uh, specific uh, thing that it needs to do. Um, so we'll dive into this a little bit today. Um, another common definition we hear here often um, is, uh, you know, AI is whatever we want to achieve in, in 10 years. So it's like we look at the movies, look at Hollywood, we see what's going on there. Many people expect this from, from AI to do whatever we see in the movies, but uh, that's really uh, quite futuristic and somewhere in the future. Um, and I think it's more important to look at what we have today already. So we'll be doing a little bit of this. Uh, but first, very briefly, I want to touch on the potential uh, of AI in general, but also for the publishing industry. Um, I feel like AI can perform certain tasks faster, cheaper, better, more reliant and more relentless than humans can. And it can also do a lot of things that humans can't do at all. Maybe just two examples that relate to publishing. Um, on the one hand, the topic of uh, digitizing books. If we, if we look at um, 
uh, or if we think about um, the physical book that we have there, we want to turn this into something digital. In, you know, in the past, you would have to sit there and type up every single word. Of course, that, that, that day takes uh, hours and hours and days and days. And nowadays, as many of us have done, you can just scan it and the technology automatically detects the word and, um, and, and turns it into digital letters. So that's a very simple example of AI that we've all seen. Um, a different one is complex recommendation systems, which are also quite interesting. If you think about a traditional bookstore, right? If a person goes into a bookstore and tells the, the bookseller, look, I like to read thrillers, I like to read Stephen King, can you recommend anything to me? It will be quite easy for the bookseller to do that. But if we uh, have a, a reader who's a lot more uh, in a certain niche sector, has very, a very specific taste, the bookseller might not able, be able to help this person, um, then uh, AI can come, uh, can come uh, into, into, um, into good effect. For example, if you look at online booksellers like what, what Amazon does, right? They have millions of books and they have millions and millions of users. So they can match the user consumption and, and buying patterns of all of these users out there to make a recommendation that is really based uh, on your preferences because they have many people who have similar preferences. And there's just two examples of what AI can do also in the publishing world. And I will have some, some bigger examples in a bit. Um, but I want to make sure uh, that you understand that there are also a lot of limitations to AI. Uh, like I said, uh, we're talking about weak AI. It can't do everything out there. Um, one of the most famous and the earliest examples of the use of AI uh, was when IBM's AI Deep Blue beat the chess uh, champion Gary Kasparov in 1997. So that was a turning point because, well, since then it was clear that the AI and the computers, they're always going to be better than humans at playing chess. That's you know, a bit sad that if you're a chess player and you want to play against uh, machines. Um, but it's also quite logical because, uh, because chess is a very logical mathematical game. So it, it lends itself perfectly to what an AI can actually do. Um, but it's also important to understand that this AI could only do this. It could only play chess. It didn't know it was playing chess. It didn't have any joy when winning. It could only perform this certain task. Gary Kasparov can do a lot of things that this AI can't do. He can write books. He wrote a couple. He can speak. He can sing. He can, well, hopefully he can sing. Um, he can tie his shoelaces. He can do so many things that this AI can't do. So it's really it's very limited in, in what its abilities are. Um, uh, and to quote him, uh, I think it's important to understand that AI is a tool. It's a technology, uh, but it's not a magic wand and it's not the Terminator. So that just let the think in uh, for, for a minute. Just one, um, one more aspect that's important to understand is the topic of accuracy. So getting to 80% accuracy uh, with a certain uh, tool is, depending on the set of rules, it's quite feasible. So getting to 80%, all right, that's not the big problem in many cases. But getting from 80 to 100% being perfect in terms of accuracy, that's really quite complicated. Um, and that's something that you have to keep in mind when working with AI. There's two examples here. Um, one example is um, you know, using AI to optimize uh, recommendation systems. Um, this is being done if you go on Netflix uh, and if there are 10 movies are recommended to you based on your viewing behavior. Um, if you like eight of those movies, eight of them are good, two of them are you know, not to your liking, that's no problem. If the 80% accuracy is here, that, that works fine. You can just skip those other two movies. It's still an okay user experience. But if you look at self-driving cars, for example, if the AI is supposed to de detect people crossing the streets, and if there's 10 people crossing the streets and the AI only sees eight of them uh, and kills the other two, then you're not so happy with 80% accuracy. Um, so that's the reason why we have recommendation systems in place, but self-driving cars aren't implemented in a wider sense. They also work, but it's not 100% yet. And that's a topic where 100% is very important. So keeping that in mind, I'll, I'll show a few examples of AI in the uh, publishing world. Um, one, um, and don't worry, you don't have to read the entire text here. Um, this is an example used by the Washington Post in the US, and many different media players use this as well. Um, so the Washington Post introduced their AI called Heliograph a few years ago, um, where they actually turn database events into full length texts, and they publish thousands of articles per year. So what they do is they take data, like you can see on the left, which is uh, from a high school uh, football game, right? So somebody sits in the stadium, takes notes, writes down the important uh, points, who 
to score a touchdown, etc., is you all put into a database. And usually, or in the past, um, articles would just feature the, the, the key bullet points and numbers. But so when using AI, you can actually enhance this and turn it into a larger text that you can see on the right. Now, this is not uh, the greatest text ever written, but it can really turn pure data into something a bit more enjoyable for many readers. Um, and this has been done on a large scale in many countries by many news publishers when you want to write about local elections, local sports event, anything that's number based really. So this is a great, great use uh, in the content space. Um, something else in the content space um, as an example that comes from DeepL, it's a Germany based uh, translation service uh, that's supposed to be better than, than Google Translate uh, for certain tasks. Um, so you can't use this to translate an entire book and then publish it. You could, but the result wouldn't be that great. Um, but what's being done so far, this is used by many, many translators and editors to automize part of their work and make their life easier. So they enter text, press the button, have it translated, and then they can change certain words and then add their personal touch to it. So really this speeds up the process by a lot. Um, and I know a couple of publishers who've actually bought book rights based on sample translation that were um, put into uh, DeepL. So this is just a tool that, that makes life easier and quicker for a couple of people in the industry. Text to speech for audiobooks is another interesting topic. There's many, many companies out there, uh, be it Iridan, Alibaba in China, Kindle, Google, Microsoft in the US, that work on enhancing the quality of text to speech. So you've all heard text to speech. It's if you have a text, then you press a button and the robot basically reads out the text to you. There's varying degrees in quality. Um, uh, in the past, it was very robotic, but we're getting closer and closer to a more natural sounding uh, human voice, thanks to artificial intelligence. And um, this will be quite interesting to, to view um, and see if we get to the point or when we get to the point, it's more a matter of, of when and not if. Um, you can just press a button, you can seamlessly move between you know, reading an ebook, pressing a button and then having, having it read to you and make sure it sounds like a human voice. But of course, this brings some challenges with it, with it for the audiobook industry, because there's of course many people that you know, earn a living licensing and producing audiobooks. Um, and there have already been some lawsuits um, in the US um, regarding this topic to make sure that this uh, technology can't you know, do everything it, it, it wants to. Uh, another example is more in the marketing space, um, comes from Bookwire, a European ebook and audiobook distribution company. They introduced um, something called dynamic in-book ads within their ebooks. So what they do there is if you if you scroll, if you, if you buy an ebook from them uh, on, on Amazon or iBookstore or wherever, um, if you scroll to the end of the ebook, if you're done, there's recommendations in the end, you know, books you might enjoy reading, which is an advertisement to, to buy the next book. Now, this has been done manually on a large scale in the past, but what they've done now for their all of the publishers they work with, they can automatically introduce and include the perfect uh, upselling opportunity across the catalog. So on a daily basis, they can introduce the book by the publisher that they think or that their AI thinks will sell the most copies. And they track the data and they are constantly optimized. So they update the assets like every day to make sure the right book is in the end. Um, and by using this, they've, uh, you know, uh, they've increased backlist sales up to 20% for uh, a number of their, their publishers just by using this tool. Um, a different example, this comes from a Dutch publisher that I've uh, talked to in the past. It's a large publisher in the Netherlands, um, and they're actually tracking 39 different variables when they publish new books. So they look at pre-order numbers, they look at Google trend data, they look at performance of social media by the authors to really determine in the end how many titles should be print. So it's not just a gut feeling, but it's purely number-based, and it has a machine learning component because they, uh, they don't just um, you know, do this on, 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 on a, you know, looking at a database per title, but they also feed in the actual real sales data in the end, so they actually learn um, uh, from their experiences. Um, and this way they can decide, do they print 500 books, 5,000 or 50,000, to make sure they have the right number at hand. And one last example uh, that, uh, that comes from, uh, from me, of my company Goldfinch, um, we started working with publishers to, to analyze the, the catalogs. So something we did here for a number of larger publishers is we, we actually uh, analyzed uh, their authors, um, not in terms of content, but really purely in terms of data, looking at uh, different trend data performance across different channels. 
to determine how, how popular uh, uh, these authors were and how their development was over time. And um, uh, by doing this, we could determine uh, how likely the success rate of certain authors uh, was going forward, um, be it for their own catalog, but also for competitor catalogs. And this is being used right now for publishers to make uh, decisions regarding backlist marketing. Right? If you have an author that's performed well in the uh, well in the past couple of months, um, and that's really quite you know, old, you see, okay, maybe there's a reason here why people are interested in the author. Maybe we should you know, put a bit of money into backlist marketing. Or on the other hand, if you see a certain author is doing really well, um, you can you know, approach them, see if they want to write a new book or also approach your, your competition um, or the, the publishers and the authors that are with the competition. Um, so that's something that we are, we are uh, you know, working on right now um, and also using this data to make decisions which books should be turned into audiobooks. And um, it's still early days, but I think there's huge potential in using data to making these kinds of uh, decisions. Um, and to sum things up, and some of these things I haven't had the chance to say uh, because of time, but I want to say them again. Um, I think it's, it's undoubtable that AI is going to be a critical success factor for publishers, for anybody out there, but we still have to remember what Gary says. So it's, uh, you know, it's not the magic wand, it's not the Terminator, it really it is what you make of it. Um, and I feel like um, a lot of publishers have understood the first ones are doing interesting things. Um, but uh, you know, not so many are really taking the necessary steps that I feel are, are important to, to move ahead and go with the time. Um, but those who have already done experiments and have started, they're quite happy with the, the results and the return. Um, uh, a lot of people are still skeptical. I think they should move past that and, and accept that technology is here to stay and they should have a look at, at what they can actually uh, do with it. Um, but still keep in mind, machines are not gonna write the books anytime soon. It's still the humans writing the books. It's the machines helping us uh, to make the process as easy as possible and to help with everything around it and to strengthen the core business. And to do that, you have to be in the right mindset. You have to have the right organizational structure to support that. Uh, maybe also look for examples outside of publishing, see what you can learn from them and uh, really you know, get started, make your own experiments. And to do that, I think uh, collaborating with other publishers, with other companies, also getting outside experts uh, um, into the game is super important. Um, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. You can start with a small budget, but it's just important that you that you do something. And that's my strongest pledge to you today. Just get started. Um, you don't ignore technology, but um, yeah, use it for your own benefit. So yeah, thank you for your, for your time. These are my contact details. If you want to talk, I'm, I'm happy to for you to get in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colin. And if publishers, as you said, some are uh, haven't yet realized that they must get started. So if they wanted to get started, they could talk to you, yeah? Surely. Okay, so that's good to know. Thank you so much for sharing this. Um, really good to, to know and to understand uh, what AI can do and what its limits are uh, on a broad basis. Thank you. Um, let's move on to Gerald. Jared will also introduce yourself, please, a little bit, and then um, you'll be talking about uh, AI and EduTech. Over to you. Right. Thank you, Claudia. Thanks for the opportunity to be here uh, to share our perspective. Uh, it's going to be a bit tough to follow Colin's very comprehensive uh, coverage. Uh, try my best, uh, but obviously with a, a very focused perspective from uh, EduTech and Edu. Uh, occasional publishing. So my name is Jerry Chai. Uh, I uh, am the co-founder and MD for SnapLearn. We are a augmented and virtual reality uh, specialist, uh, which is a spin-off company out of the National University of Singapore. Uh, so you might be wondering why AR and VR in the context of uh, this uh, conversation in AI, because uh, actually AR and VR is underpinned by this foundational level of technology called computer vision. And computer vision, for those who are familiar with it, is actually one of the subset of uh, AI, uh, because uh, this is where the advancements in, uh, uh, in uh, artificial intelligence, as uh, shared with Colin, in the field of narrow intelligence, what you call weak AI, artificial narrow intelligence, one of the subset is computer vision, 
uh, which is what we actually use as the fundamental technology underpinning our offering. So uh, just uh, taking a bit of a step, step back into educational uh, industry and then educational publishing uh, and then finally the applications uh, that uh, we are seeing. So in education, what we typically are grappling with are three core issues. Number one is efficiency. Number two is uh, effectiveness. Number three is engagement. So these are the three key issues that any education uh, company organization typically have to grapple with. Uh, in terms of the applications of AI in those areas, I would say that, for example, in efficiency, how are we using AI to disseminate information, content to a large number of users in a very timely fashion? So think of using chatbots uh, that is able to give administrative course information to students. Think of uh, auto-grading tools that helps the teachers to cut down time in terms of grading uh, assignments and assessments. In terms of uh, effectiveness, this is what we usually say the holy grail of uh, where we hope that technology such as AI can help us with uh, to achieve things like personalized learning, differentiated instructions. So uh, think of smart and adaptive learning that is able to change the level of content and the type of content depending on the learner's profile, uh, their strengths and weaknesses, and whether they are an auditory or visual learner. And then uh, finally, the third part is on engagement. So engagement is where uh, we are talking about how do you forge an emotive connection between the learner with the content, uh, between learners to learners, and obviously learners to teach. Motive connection, the stronger the engagement rates and actually leading to better understanding and better retention. So I'm going to uh, take that as a context and shift it to a specific uh, examples of what our company SnapLearn is doing and how we apply AI in those areas. <clears throat> okay, so uh, very quickly, because I didn't uh, prepare a presentation, instead I will show a quick live demo. So our app is SnapLearn. Uh, is, is this clear or is the screen too glaring? Okay, okay. so uh, once the user open out our app, uh, what they do is that they open out the content. So this is an example of a publisher partner that we work with, right? Inside, there's a, a page on the human body. This is a primary school or elementary school book. So with our app, when you scan the image, very quickly it picks out. And then now instead of just reading about the human body, they can actually see it in 3D in AR. Right, so this is where the engagement piece, the computer vision uh, picks up the image and then throws up this. So this is one example. I'm going to move on very quickly to another book, which is a secondary school book on biology. So same thing here. What we do is that we have a image, we have a page talking about the human heart. So what happens is that when the user takes the app, and then they, when they are reading this page, they take the app, they are scanning the page. Again, image recognition picks up, and then the 3D model of a heart comes out. Okay, and then the final example I'll give is another title, another book at a higher education level, which is an uh, uh, undergraduate level book. Same thing, where there's an image of a heart. Obviously, it's in increasing difficulty, right? From a primary school level book, as I shown earlier on, to a secondary school book, to a higher education book. So the point I'm trying to make here is this. Today, what our company has to offer is actually based on current level of technology, which is based on image recognition. So we recognize the image on each of the book. We throw out the 3D model in AR to drive the engagement, right? And then obviously it's a very efficient way of doing it. But think of this, 
what if with AI, we are able to automatically detect the differences between these images? Because right now, in today's context and today's technology, asking a computer software to recognize these images is actually incredibly difficult. To the computer, they are actually thinking that this could be a balloon for that, for all its matter. Right? So you need very large data set of data to be able to train the software program, the AI, the, the machine with uh, the AI backend to be able to understand and differentiate between those uh, images and what it means. But increasingly, as technology advances, what we are seeing is that uh, the availability of data set the availability of images publicly uh, through uh, you know, TensorFlow and all these uh, large open source data, data set is starting to advance to a sufficiently uh, big and advanced stage where we are now able to tell the computer image with a certain level of accuracy, as Colin said, to be able to differentiate that this is a human body, this is a diagram, it's not just a ropes, uh, of a, uh, and all, all these points that uh, the human eye can easily pick up. So what is going to be very interesting also for us is that we are also starting to incorporate natural language processing. NLP is also another branch of AI. So what it means is that instead of just looking at the image, our software is in R&D stage, eventually we'll be able to tell based on the keywords here, the text, to say that, all right, uh, it's talking about human, it's talking about body, it's talking about heart, and pair up with, uh, correspond with uh, images that are similar to a heart, we have a certain level of confidence to say that this page is talking about a human body, about the heart, about the circulatory system, and when you scan it, it just pulls up a heart automatically. So it is a very exciting time for us in terms of uh, from our company's perspective of the advancements in AI and we are very seriously researching into these areas and what does this mean uh, for our publishers uh, partners and generally for the publishing industry as a whole I was I'll go back to the point I mentioned about the three key points about uh, efficiency effectiveness and engagement so imagine the day when any students with an app like this, they are able to point the app on any publications, at least in the educational field, and be able to automatically and very efficiently pick up the images and corresponding uh, extra information like a human body heart. That's efficiency. Number two, obviously, it will be in a much more engaging manner and very immersive. And then Obviously, uh, that hopefully lead to the last point in a personalized context. Uh, it understands that you are a, a K-12 student, uh, you are scanning a, a content that is of K-12, uh, they are going to send out relevant information, age appropriate, level appropriate. So it's a very exciting time uh, for us. Uh, and we are working hard on realizing this vision. And uh, what I will, I will do is that if we have time at the end of this uh, uh, session for Q&A, I can talk more specifically into how I see the opportunities and the challenges for educational publishers uh, generally. So over, back, over to you, uh, Claudia. Yeah, thank you so much, Gerald. That uh, was very insightful. Um, and yes, yeah, so that would have been the question that I would want to ask you about uh, educational publishing, but maybe we'll do that later at a later stage. Thank you. And uh, let's move back to Europe, to Denmark with Mats Raidal. Hi, Mats. Um, uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you about what you do, what you're working on. And yeah, please, over to you. I, you have to read. Now we cannot hear you. Can you hear him? We cannot hear you. Ah, 
here we go. Maybe that helps. Yes, it does. Okay, well, hello. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties all around. So my name is Matt Rydale. I'm VP product for Tactics Labs. Um, I was until recently uh, co-founder of a startup called Unsilo. We've been providing services to academic publishers for uh, eight or nine years, uh, the larger publishers in Europe. And uh, now we're part of the Cactus family. And we have a number of offerings that I'd like to go through, uh, as well as talk a little bit about what we think the future might hold uh, and what we're working on. So Max? Max? Yeah. Uh, you're not, your voice not very clear, at least not to me. Can you hear him well? So, so, la, la. Right. If there's anything you can do about it, it would be great. Yeah, I can try to use a different microphone. How is this? Oh, much better. Much better. Okay. Sorry about that. I will try once again. I hope you can cut this out from uh, from the presentation. Um, so let me just go back and share. Uh, do, do you want me to start over since this is recorded? Um, no, that's fine. Sound? That's okay. okay. Please go on. Cool. Okay. So, um, as I said, we're now part of a larger company called Cactus. We're uh, the largest provider of uh, author services in the world, meaning that we have a, a host of uh, uh, well-educated um, editors helping out authors around the globe, uh, improving their manuscripts. Uh, so our focus is on, on helping um, um, authors provide uh, better manuscripts, and that's where I really think the evolution of AI is going to uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make a difference in the, in the years to come. Uh, we have a new uh, umbrella um, of, um, of products uh, called PaperPal, uh, which is going to be launching services to help authors uh, in the next uh, few months and years. So let me just advance here. Um, in the past, Ansalo has worked on providing um, related recommender systems, related content uh, for a number of larger publishers. We've done automatic tagging of keywords for uh, Springer and, and, and Nature. We've done content um, uh, analysis and, and clustering uh, being used, for instance, uh, by OECD and the UN for the SDG um, uh, Sustainable Development Goals clustering them and understanding underlying literature published by the UN uh, on these topics. Uh, it's also being used by uh, the BMJ, for instance, uh, uh, for their topic portals and essentially uh, automating a lot of the editorial tasks that uh, up until now has taken uh, a lot of uh, human effort. Uh, we're also uh, doing um, expertise location. This is a reviewer finder. Uh, that allows you to, uh, to identify uh, promising reviewers for incoming manuscripts. Um, but this new product I'm going to talk about today uses some of that knowledge and those platform technologies to provide services directly to the author. And, uh, and this comes in, in many different flavors. But before I continue, maybe a little bit of context, because what we're striving for here is really to help users create content. Uh, and that's a, a little bit of a long shot. Uh, in other technologies we've seen, or in other domains, we've seen AI-supported content creation. We know this from Photoshop, if you've ever tried that. Um, we have tools that can help you remove um, errors or elements of an image. Uh, we can also use deep learning to, to transfer styles uh, from, from known paintings, and, and like this is uh, Van Gogh and Munch. And you can apply that directly to, uh, to photographs in order to create new images as seen through the lens of, of an impressionist artist. Uh, why doesn't this exist for content creation, for, uh, for text? Well, it's just because text is actually much harder than pixels. Uh, it's taken many years for us to develop deep learning that can do something similar. Uh, the best we have today is uh, Grammarly and, and, and Rightful, I guess, for, for academic authors. 
which basically uh, helps you analyze uh, small parts of your text and do small corrections. Very, very similar, I guess, to uh, what Microsoft has been doing for for years, and, and most recently with their ideas sidebar. Uh, we're providing grammar and, and style guidance. But we're not really uh, taking it uh, a whole step further. Um, some smaller startups are doing more interesting things, uh, like uh, this is a site that are uh, doing analysis of, um, of cite citing articles. So if you're looking at an academic article, site will help you understand that of the articles that cited this particular article, how many uh, actually agreed or disagreed uh, with the key findings in this article. So this helps you uh, basically uh, do a little bit of fact checking or, or some filtering on should I, should I be uh, critical of this article? Is this widely accepted or not? Um, so trends are definitely moving uh, towards providing more sophisticated uh, decision support uh, and, uh, and, 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 and much more understanding the text uh, in, in academic research. So um, we've uh, taken the first step in this uh, direction uh, to help authors improve their manuscripts prior to submission. Because uh, um, one of the key problems that we've identified that should be addressed is that authors really have to wait for a long time for sub uh, submitting manuscripts and getting uh, feedback on their submissions. Um, and it's also a very cumbersome process. Uh, the average author spends 10 hours to submit a manuscript. You wouldn't think that, I guess. And then they have to wait uh, anywhere between 100 and 200 days for publication or even two or three months just to get a rejection. Uh, on the other uh, side of the fence, editors are overburdened. Uh, they're seeing an influx in, uh, in submissions from authors who are like maybe trying to submit slightly above their pay grade or slightly in a slightly more um, um, uh, renowned journal that requires uh, more uh, previous authorship, uh, which causes a more rejection rate, a high rejection rates and, um, and, and basically frustrates editors because they spend all their time uh, dealing with this influx of potentially not very relevant submissions. Um, we've did a survey um, uh, in our company um, uh, earlier this year. Uh, we also published a report around that survey. So that shows that technical checks, which is the checks that editors perform on, on incoming manuscripts are eating 80%, uh, well, well, a lot of their time and 80% of editorial offices actually do this on their on the first submission. Uh, it's a huge amount of effort wasted and the uh, editorial offices are actually prepared to get help uh, with this assessment or uh, help authors uh, run assessments on their own. Um, so this product that we've built, uh, PaperPal Preflight, is a web-based tool that allows authors to upload their manuscripts uh, prior to submission and get feedback so that they can correct changes themselves instead of waiting two or three months for the journal editor to come back and say, by the way, we can't accept your manuscript, please correct this before we, uh, we're gonna assess it. Uh, so it catches the most common errors and omissions related to both uh, technical reporting, so the um, uh, decorations you must make and, uh, and, and, and also um, uh, language issues and, and language improvement suggestions. Um, so we have around 30 technical checks that are currently also deployed inside uh, the leading uh, sort of manuscript uh, tracking systems that the uh, publishers use. Uh, so we're already providing technical checks there in Scholar One and Editorial Manager. Oh, sorry about this. Um, but uh, now we've turned around and providing this directly to the authors. Um, so the idea, of course, is that authors can correct their manuscripts and make them drastically better. And, uh, and they can actually also receive suggestions um, for, um, for, for language improvements that are trained on the 20 years of um, uh, manual uh, editing effort that uh, Cactus has done. Uh, to all of our clients. So we've built particular language models that are capable of correcting language in, in academic manuscripts. And we're much better than, than some of the more general uh, services out there. Uh, and, and, and by doing that, they will eventually also, you know, authors will ease on, on the editorial process. So having a little bit of technical issues here. So um, 
is there any integration needed now? You, this is, a, uh, I guess, a conference also directed at publishers. So you might think uh, this is probably going to be a lot of work to integrate, but it's actually not. It's just placing a link and promoting it. Uh, so it's right now live on Medicine, uh, the uh, Walter Scriver um, journal. And they've uh, chosen to include uh, uh, Paper Pelf Prefight as a recommendation in their pre-submission checklist. Uh, so authors are, are recommended to go there. Uh, first and check out their manuscript. Uh, you can recommend it many other places and we're seeing actually a, a tremendous uh, pickup uh, uh, on medicine. What does it look like? Well, um, basically it's really simple. You can drag and drop uh, a manuscript uh, into the frame. Um, we'll run a process, check for uh, a number of things, uh, declarations of ethical statement, funding statement, data access. Um, and then we'll give you a rating. Uh, if the rating's green, you can get an, um, uh, all of our language suggestions and corrections for free. If there are any issues identified, you can download an edited Word file for $29. Um, and that's basically it. And uh, you can actually go and, and try it out right now uh, to see if you want to put it in front of your authors. Um, so the business case for this is actually pretty clear. If you have a, a journal with around 10,000 annual submissions, the revenue uh, improvements could be around uh, $40,000 uh, for uh, um, um, just a revenue share and plus your cost savings are actually even more. Uh, if you take on average five minutes to perform technical checks, then your cost reduction, reduction could be around $10,000. The payoff for the author, shorter time for first submission, fewer resubmissions, better submission experience for the journal, monetizing the submissions, cutting costs, and improving the author experience at the same time. And for the editor, of course, fewer desk, desk rejections, higher quality manuscripts, less time spent, and shorter time to publication. So we really think this is a no-brainer. Well, thank you for your uh, attention, and I'll hand the uh, microphone back to Claudia. Thank you very much, Matt. That sounds uh, very... Um, interesting and obviously also your business case shows that um, uh, there's a lot in in it for authors and for editors. So yeah, very cool. Yeah, we Thank have, you. We have high hopes for this. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, and from Europe, we go back to Jakarta and yeah. on to Alfred. Hi everyone. Well. Uh, okay, let me do some sharing because I think I'm the only one that uh, came from really, really uh, back to the engineer and the researcher. Although that I read some books that I'm totally learning from all of you guys. And I think it's a, it's a kind of moment as well because uh, it's a good sharing, basically. So let me start my um, uh, document as well with a second. Yeah, so, so you, you guys can see my uh, slides? Yes. All right, uh, let me start a bit. I mean, basically, again, uh, good day, everyone. Um, such a pleasure for me to have this moment sharing about piece of knowledge, definitely, in short period of times. Uh, indeed, thank you for the organizer, definitely, to hosting this virtual event, right? Well, I watched uh, a great insight from uh, Colin, uh, Gerald, and Matt, and I believe that uh, what I will bring in here is only a small part of activities in the industry, especially from the uh, research perspective. Again, my name is Alfred. I'm a researcher from uh, Samsung Research, and it's very interesting for me to share a bit from the device company perspective that might related with the intelligence, uh, especially when you're talking about AI in here, that probably also can be benefit for the publisher, right? Let's start for the next slide. But again, before I start, uh, stay safe and healthy. Keep innovate yourself for better tomorrow, right? So, uh, well, everyone knows that, um, as it mentioned from earlier from, uh, speakers, I mean, uh, Colin and Gerald mentioning as well, Matt's. AI is a branch of computer science uh, that aims of uh, create intelligence machine. It has basically become an essential part of the technology industry. In this slide, um, 
um, what do we see from this picture that representing AI? Well, definitely not about the logos. That's not my logos. But the activities that can represent AI in our daily life. Well, research associated in AI is highly technical and specialized. The core problem of AI, including programming computers, somewhat uh, and conclude about the, about the knowledge, um, reasoning, problem solving, uh, perception, learning, planning, um, ability uh, of to manipulate and move all the objects. And basically with that, it's potential to compute and analyze the huge amount of data. Any kind of advanced machine learning techniques are being used in business to perform a complex jobs quicker and more efficiently. I show what, uh, I mean, I, I watch what uh, being shown by uh, Gerald and also um, by Matt's about the technology in here. But again, with our way of thinking, why we need an AI? Well, basically we are growing at a huge rate, uh, say in the terms of population, knowledge and jobs and many others. Our increase in scale also increase the entropy of systems demanding of huge amount of numbers of the things that to be automated and centralized. Basically, uh, AI in simple words is implementing uh, human senses into machines. Um, although we are seeing automation jobs leading to job cutting, maybe someday publisher will be no longer necessary to print out the books yeah. as they are uh, will be automatically represented in the smart devices. But again, uh, what will be the job the, the writer and the author in here? And anyway, in the positive terms, it's going to major shift and uh, for all of us. So let's move to the next slide. So again, I believe everyone in here is using at least one smart devices, either smartphones, smart wearables, or other device and smart gadgets. So the things we use, carry, wear on daily basis are growing on intelligence space, right? More and more our appliances are able to detect changes in their environment and modify our behavior based on those changes. Pressure sensors are one of the technology enabling smarter consumer electronics. Adding the sensors uh, to consumer devices basically will give us the new entire uh, dimension to explore the information and basically to create, improve the user experience. I can see also a very interesting part uh, that what uh, Gerald made it in terms of like vision. It's really intriguing here, making the, what is our next product stand from the crowd, right? Yeah. And what we can see also from the current product portfolio in the market, what also like what, uh, um, well, Matt's presented. And anyway, it's many kind of things though. But in the enterprise domain, there's a lot of uh, buzz surrounding the IoT as well. Uh, in a world which everything smart and connected, including the publishing industry. In making about the data come together in a new ways, and it's always a potential change to, uh, to uh, changes all the transform all the aspect in our life. Well, in a data driven world, smart devices will communicate each other and to connect action in a common platform. So, Next, next slide, please. Uh, okay. So, well, in this slide, I just want to share about the efficiency that uh, drives the device capability. Well, uh, these dramatic changes are just basically the beginning. Machine learning in general continue uh, in their expansion from what today largely classified and perceptual tasks to roles that make an impact across the complex stack of mobile and embed computing. Machine learning basically in here already have become the core of algorithm for autonomous systems from smartphones, robots, drones, cars, and many others. More broadly, we are basically witnessing the discovery how the system component and algorithms can have their performance and function radically improved by the integration of deep neural networks. So in short, um, I, can share, uh, I can say in here that basically we are enabling the state of the art techniques across all the systems. It was mentioned, uh, uh, like what uh, Gerald mentioned here, and also what uh, Matt mentioned here, that is a computer vision, that is NLU, NLP as well, and many others, right? And the other things, we should also have a concern about the user privacy. Well, some, uh, for example, case in publishing work, it will be one of the good support to automate the, intellect, uh, the intellectual property among the writers, right? 
with the current research and the open source framework, there is no need uh, developing a range of simple uh, complex machine learning models. So there's a lot of tools that already easily to be used, like simple enabled AI application, like Overleaf, Grammarly, or even in the Google Docs, right? And there will be a real-time execution with a dependency on the network connectivity. That's actually part on the challenging uh, area, what we call it on device approach. And I think that's many others. And I believe there is a lot of things that we can bring up to the tables with the capability improvements. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Okay. So in here, I just want to share an overview about the, our background that drive on device research activities. Well, there has been a constant movement of AI toward uh, edge devices. Uh, this has been possible due to the increase of computing power coupled with uh, an improvement in al AI algorithms and the production of the robust hardware and software from the TensorFlow uh, software, cafe, chipset, and many others. These advancements basically have made uh, a possible run machine learning solution on smartphone and other smart devices, rather in cloud processes. And this trend somehow is, is increasing, right? Well, in media journalism, it can be a powerful use case, especially when they are write a story in the field. Mm, as we're talking about publishing agency, uh, there are also about some benefit and challenges that they might facing like automated text analysis to help them more accurate proofreading or uh, plagiarism checking, something like that. Automatic text uh, tagging and formattings. Um, I think some of the features already mentioned also uh, by Matt's, also about the content personalization and translation and many others, right? Basically that will be bring on device research use case more um, appealing to various to industries. And in Samsung research, we're working to more improve in this cognitive usage of content creators or writers to be uh, having the improvement of their productivity using the many smart devices features from vision, text, speech, and many other things, right? So let's move to the next slide, right? In the summary, to conclude, I can say that AI has become uh, a trendsetter within our global market. Today, all the publishing agency, whether it's big or small, whether directly associated with uh, the user or cons uh, consumer or not, are start to benefiting the, uh, from the AI usage. Basically, uh, as it mentioned also uh, with, uh, uh, actually with uh, Colin, AI will need a trustworthy algorithms and the right data to train them. A plan to grow revenue and profits with AI and integration with existing and emerging technologies. And how we implementing toward this to the publisher? there will be a challenges and opportunities, of course. Again, adopting deep learning and various uh, constrained classes of computing, such as smartphones and smart sensors and other uh, intelligent devices, these things become common and it will be great if we can have a good collaboration together, starting from a small step and use case of learning to improve our life. Well, I like to close uh, with my favorite quotes, right? the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Anyway, this will be my last slide. And again, much appreciated for the times. And I think that I will give back the time to uh, well, to the organizer, to Claudia. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. Yes, the future is here. It's not just not evenly distributed. I think that's a, that's a very good quote. Um, hopefully, the vaccine is going to be evenly distributed soon <laughs> so that uh, we might depend less on AI. No, that of course we won't because the future is here, as you said. Thank you very much for these uh, thoughts and insights. And um, yeah, we have almost come to the end of our session, unfortunately, and uh, we should have planned much more time because these topics are so interesting um, to discuss. However, just one more last question for everyone. And um, Gerald, uh, what is your, and uh, is one word, what is your advice for educational publishers? In terms of uh, adopting AI. and using AI, mm -hmm. uh, I think one word would be difficult. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, 
general statement is uh, give it a go. You know? uh, as uh, Alfred has said, you know, right now, there's uh, so much advancement in the field of AI. Uh, it's not as expensive as you think it is. It is because there's lots of open source uh, platforms out there and the uh, computing power is uh, getting so uh, good. Uh, and the, the, I am a firm believer, believer in uh, the human creativity and ingenuity. So if we give the tools, uh, we show them uh, the possibilities, uh, some examples. I'm pretty sure uh, even a industry that is uh, so-called traditional like publishing will be able to come up with very creative use cases. And uh, as a technologies, as, uh, as a, as a uh, technology company, uh, we are able and we are more than happy to partner with them to turn, to ideate and turn those ideas into uh, reality. So uh, that will be what I will say to our publishers. Mm. Thank you. Mark, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Okay. So one last question to you. When will AI substitute authors? Um, well, hopefully never. Uh, I think uh, research, of course, uh, should be supported by all the technology available. Um, but I think when, when, when I um, look at what we've uh, accomplished in, in the last uh, few years, I think we've come a long way. I think uh, pub publishing industry has adopted uh, technology in many different places and are, and are following a, a clear path uh, that, that I think is very, uh, makes me very hopeful. Uh, there, it is a very traditional industry. And, uh, and I think in many locations or in many, many workflows, um, we're challenged to prove uh, the efficiency of the algorithms that we provide. And I think we need to be able to uh, to come up with with data to to prove that that we have accuracy and and and, and that we don't miss important things as, as I think Colin said uh, you don't want your uh, your your self driving car to miss two out of ten pedestrians right <laughs> across the <laughs> street so we uh, but but the, but the fact of the matter is also that today uh, there's actually what we call the strategy of the status quo uh, publisher actually publishers are, are rarely aware of the accuracy of their current manual processes. Uh, and I think so. So if, if, if I was to uh, maybe uh, um, in, inside some kind of change, I would ask publishers to be more aware of, of, the, uh, of, of the failures and the inaccuracies that they already have in their manual processes, because it's quite obvious that automation can help improve accuracy for some kinds of processes. And, and probably it'll be harder to use AI for other tasks. But I think the, the way to implement automation is to first understand where you're currently falling a bit short and where technology might help you. And so you need to track uh, your own performance and measure your own accuracy. And that takes uh, a lot of effort, actually. But I think that's, that's the next big challenge, uh, because otherwise you're never going to get a budget to do one of these exciting new projects. True. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Max. And Alfred, since we're talking about AI and publishing, what's your advice for the publishers in Indonesia? perhaps also in well, connection with devices. Well, thank you. It's interesting though. Basically, uh, I'm following what uh, Gerald said and also Matt and Colin and trying to summarize in here, basically to the old publisher and also the writers, without any change, there is no innovation, creativity or incentive for improvement. So basically those who initiate change will have a better opportunity to manage the change that will be in, uh, available. So the true sign of the AI is not the knowledge, but the imagination. So I think it's a matter that people are trying to improve the life. That's the most important though. So it's back to the humanity as well. So that's my quote. Mm. Thank you very much. Yeah, this was a really interesting session. Thank you so much to all of you for taking the time to contribute to the session. Um, I learned a lot, certainly. And it's interesting to hear that you, Alfred, uh, ended this with creativity, because that's why we're here. That's why we are at Jack Tent, to talk about creativity, to talk about the different creative industries. 
Mm, and we also talk a lot about digital publishing. So in this Jack 10, there are more sessions about digital publishing and we welcome all of you to join us for other sessions. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Alfred, Gerald, Colin, and Max. I hope to see you all in person soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Dengan informasi terkini Menjadi sumber referensi dan inspirasi di setiap aktivitas Melalui news video portal Segala informasi dapat tersajikan cepat, akurat, dan lengkap Dengan kekuatan teknologi digital Mytcom.id Hadir dengan berita pilihan yang dikemas secara menarik Mytcom.id Digitally inspire people Sudah 15 menit, masih kejebat macet. Tenang, tenang. Daripada emosi, 15 menit Anda jadi lebih berharga kalau bersama saya. 15 yeah. Minutes, setiap Rabu, jam 6 sore, lewat 45 menit. MediaIndonesia.com hadir dengan opini cerdas dan narasumber kredibel. Mudah diakses, informasi berkualitas ada di genggaman Anda. Klik di browser Anda www.mediaindonesia.com Dan temukan pandangan berbeda Karena fakta bisa sama, sudut pandang boleh beda Mediaindonesia.com Views and News Dalam setiap denyut kota, saya selalu menjadi saksinya. Disiarkan lebih dari 20 televisi jaringan Joe Post Group. Joe Post TV, paling Indonesia. Kebebasan pers dan gelombang era digital menghadirkan ribuan bahkan jutaan informasi dan data setiap harinya. Beragam data dan informasi berserak di berbagai tempat seiring dengan perubahan dunia yang bergerak begitu cepat. Media-media baru pun bermunculan namun kualitas informasi seolah tak lagi menjadi prioritas. Bahkan tak sedikit yang abai pada etika jurnalisme. Untuk menjawab tantangan itu, Kata Data hadir sejak April 2012 sebagai portal media di bidang ekonomi dan bisnis. Beragam sektor diulas mulai dari finansial, energi, pangan, hingga industri kreatif dan digital. Artikel mendalam dan komprehensif dengan sajian infografik yang menarik menjadi karakter utama dari Kata Data. Kata Data beritiar untuk terus menyajikan beragam informasi berkualitas untuk kemajuan negeri dan untuk kepentingan bisnis Anda. Kami percaya demokrasi yang sehat tumbuh dari kehadiran informasi dan data yang akurat. Kalau bicara pakai data. Hidup terlalu pendek untuk membiarkan pemikiran-pemikiranmu, ide-idemu terdiam begitu saja. Untuk berubah, kita perlu melangkah. Dan langkah itu lahir dari sebuah inspirasi. Republika. Start moving.